with Jeb Stewart in the war and will lose his life at Yellow Tavern. And there's a panel about him over here if you want to read about that. But Stewart first encounters Pate and John Brown in 1856 in Kansas. He's going to be in the first uh, U.S. Cav and uh, he's going to become the quartermaster and the adjutant and he ends up getting so many jobs under uh, Sumner, Edwin Sumner, that he kind of balks at it and he thinks he's got too much on his plate. Well, in 1857, he complains about this uh, to the War Department. <laughs> he went over his boss's head to the War Department. Well, you can imagine that didn't go over too well with Sumner. So Sumner busts him back down into the ranks and he's back to being a lieutenant. And in 1857, Jeb Stewart almost loses his life because he didn't want the staff job where he is uh, out there fighting the Indians. I think it's the, uh, is it the Comanches? Maybe it's the Comanches. And uh, they get into a fight on the Solomon River and Stewart comes to save the life of this young lieutenant who's just fresh out of West Point, a fellow named Lunsford Lomax. And right as Stewart rides up to save Lomax from this, this Native American, the Native American does Jeb Stewart the honor of shooting him right in the chest. And Jeb Stewart carries that bullet, I think, with him the rest of his life. It must not have been much of a bullet because it didn't kill him and shot him right in the chest. Lunsford Lomax is going to end up being one of Jeb Stewart's commanders uh, during the war at Yellow Tavern. He's going to be one of his main commanders. Uh, Lunsford Lomax, uh, I am just full of useless information, let me tell you. Lunsford Lomax ends up being president at Virginia Tech. It amazed me how many men who served under Jeb Stewart in some way, fashion, or form ends up in Blacksburg as a professor, board of visitors, something somehow related to Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech doesn't start until 1872, so it's after the war. And uh, that's one reason we don't have any statues or anything much at, at, in Blacksburg, because we're after the war, so we're not having to deal with a lot of, a lot of that. But Lomax is saved by Jeb Stewart, who gets shot for his trouble and survives all that. Couple uh, About this same time, Jeb Stewart is going to meet Flora Cook, who is the uh, daughter of Philip St. George Cook, who is a very prominent uh, Army officer, and uh, he's going to marry her. And they're going to have at, at least three, I think, more children than that. Some of them don't really survive. but. Uh, He's going to marry her. And one thing, I, another one of these things I like to talk about with Jeb Stewart is Jeb Stewart, and I'm not saying Jeb Stewart didn't love his wife or, or care about his children, but Jeb Stewart was good at networking. Let me tell you, he'd have had a Facebook page, ain't no doubt about it. Jeb on Instagram, Twitter. Jeb Stewart on Twitter, now there's a thought. <laughs> but he's really good at cultivating these relationships with higher ups, Philip St. George Cook being one of them. Uh, John Sedgwick, who's going to end up being a Union general in the war. Jeb Stewart is one of his guys, and he's very fond of Stewart. said Stewart was the greatest cavalryman ever fold in the U.S. Army, which is an interesting way of putting it. But uh, Sedgwick and Stewart are close, so he cultivates these relationships. Robert E. Lee, of course, comes to mind. And all during his time in the U.S. Army, the seven years he's in the U.S. Army, he's going to do this and uh, he's going to rise up and he'll end up being a captain before he resigns. Uh, like I said, he marries Flora. They live at Fort Riley, Fort Leavenworth in the Kansas Territory. In 1859, Jeb Stewart comes home, I think, for the last time here uh, at Laurel Hill. And he uh, comes home because he's invented this saber hitching device that he wants to sell to the War Department. And uh, he gets 5,000 bucks for this thing, which I did the inflation counter. That's about a quarter million dollars in, in today's money, if you counted that. And he's sitting in the War Department office in October 1859 when the telegraph goes crazy because somebody is trying to take the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. And Jeb Stewart and Robert E. Lee and a detachment of Marines go to Harper's Ferry. And Robert E. Lee sends Jeb Stewart up to the door of the firehouse where the locals apparently have got these guys cornered. And the door opens, and there he is, John Brown, looking right at Jeb Stewart, with apparently a rather large gun pointed at Jeb Stewart. Uh, Brown later bragged that he could have killed Stewart easily if he'd have wanted to. Uh, Jeb Stewart started debating John Brown about the uh, 
uh, being what a Christian should be versus not what a Christian should be. You should really read those conversations. Lord have mercy. But Stuart recognizes John Brown. I think he's the only one there who would recognize John Brown because he had seen him before in Kansas. So they capture John Brown and Stuart is one of the ones that goes in there and he gets, I think, John Brown's Bowie knife, which is, I think, at the Virginia Historic Society today, still in their exhibits. But in 1859, I think this is something that really changes Jeb Stewart's outlook. Before then, he is all gun ho I'm in the U.S. Army. The Army's done everything for me. After that, Jeb Stewart starts thinking that war is really coming, and I've got to choose a side. Uh, to the point where Jeb Stewart, as an officer in the United States Army, is writing the governor of Virginia, telling him things like, we need to start getting ready to war, because it's coming. And he, I think, recognizes that. So for two years, Stewart returns back out there to uh, Kansas. He ends up as far away as uh, Colorado, eastern Colorado, and places like that. Uh, I went to the U.S. National Archives one time, and you can go and look at the post returns from all these forts, and you can see who's where. And I figured out everywhere Jeb Stewart was. And twice I've gone out and traveled the country and visited all the places that Jeb Stewart was at as a U.S. Army officer. My mother, bless her heart, used to make this terrible joke about me. She said that I'd been everywhere that George, that Jeb Stewart's horse had ever took a crap in the U.S. Army. <laughs> Uh, my mother, by the way, my mother loved this place. My mother uh, was instrumental in, in getting this place saved. We don't, I don't talk about her enough, but she and my father put a lot of money up. The flowers at the entrance for years were my mother's doing. And uh, my mother was as good a Baptist woman as there ever was. And she'd come out here and there'd be dead guys in blue laying out here on the on the ground and my WMU mother would go God don't that do your heart good <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> Betty Betty Hobbs Perry uh, that reminds me that reminds me of something else uh, that I'll get to to that in a minute but there's been a lot of people here who have helped save this place uh, my mother being one of them but uh, and I'll talk about some of the others too but uh, in 1859 Jeb Stewart's mother is going to sell this place she sells it to two men from Mount Airy uh, Galloway and Hollingsworth Hollingsworth was her doctor and uh, they're going to divide it up and it'll end up the property that the Jeb Stewart birthplace pretty much owns now goes to the Dillenbachs and the Hills or the Brant Browns. Mary Dillenback standing here with her camera uh, is, is one of those Dillenbachs. Her uh, mother and father I think uh, did a lot to save William Letcher's grave and take care of that and the Browns who uh, own this property that you're standing on, and they lived in the little white house that's right over here. His name was George Elbert Shug Brown and Icy Bowman Brown. And uh, let me just tell you, you talk about two characters, Lord have mercy. I was a little boy, my mother would leave me with the Browns because I was interested in the history of this place. Well, if you were you went to see Suge and Icy, what happened to you is Suge would bring you out here and would walk you around this place and tell you everything he knew about it. Suge used to give bricks away that we think were the foundation of the Stewart House to anybody who came out here as a souvenir of your visit. He told me one time that he had a closet full of them and had given them all away. Icy, on the other hand, documented the history of this place. She had scrapbooks like you would not believe of everything relating to the history of this place. And I got to see them. Here's an example. In 1952, Archibald Stewart was still buried right over there. In 1952, the Stewarts came to Suge and Icy and wanted to move him to Saltville, Virginia, where his wife, Elizabeth, is buried and the Browns let them do that and they moved Archibald Stewart to Saltville and that's where he is today. But the only way I would ever have known that is Icy wrote it down in her scrapbook. 
and gave the exact date and what happened. And that's how you find out history. Go find the oldest person you know and talk to them. And Icy Bowman Brown is the reason we know half of the stuff we, we know about all this place. I'm looking at Amy Brown Sawyer's back there eating her uh, whatever it is. W wave at everybody, Amy. Amy's mom and dad were Joe Bill and Edith. Joe Bill and Edith gave us the option to save this place. They were the administrators of Sugar and Icy's uh, estate. Uh, Icy was, I think, in a home when we first started doing this. And uh, I think they probably needed the money for Icy to take care of her. And uh, we lost Edith this past year. Edith and my dad were in high school together. Amy and I don't even want to think about that. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, they, uh, they were in high school together. But Joe, Bill, and Edith, again, these people who saved this place, uh, if Joe Bill had not given us the option and then kept his word to me on the option because people tried to buy it out from under us, they had people approach him because, I mean, look, wouldn't you like to have a house up there on that hill? And he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He kept his word to us, and that's the reason this place is saved today. And so uh, we got uh, 70 acres from the Browns and I think about five from the Dillenbachs out of the 1,500 that Mrs. Stewart sold in 1859. So, uh, again... Uh, I'm talking about a lot of things and going off on tangents, but I want you to understand that this place just didn't happen. This was a cow pasture in uh, 1988 when the first article I ever got published about this came out in the Winston-Salem Journal. And uh, two years later, we had an option, and a year after that, we, uh, we got this place. Now, this blows people's mind. I bet, John, this will blow your mind li living up in Richmond. We got this place for, I think, $800 an acre. I bet in Richmond you couldn't get probably two, three feet for $800 uh, an acre. So just to show you, that's uh, what we paid for this place in 1909. Later, they bought five more acres across the river, which was uh, the Dillenbachs property. Uh, and Mary, uh, Mary, uh, Mary and I could go on and on talking about this, but you know when you grow up here Relationships are how you get things done and the way I was able to get some of this done Was that I worked in tobacco for the Dillon backs? Uh, I occasionally worked in tobacco for Joe Bill Brown But you develop relationships with people so when I went to Joe Bill and said hey We'd like to save this place. He knew who I was Edith knew who I was because of my father and that's one of the reasons we were able to get the option on this place, I think, is you create relationships with people. And that's how we did it. So like I said, Mrs. Stewart, she sells this place in 1859, and she moves away to Danville for a while, and then she's going to end up in Saltville. Now, another one of the heroes of this story is a guy who we don't talk about enough is Jeb's brother, William Alexander Stewart. He's the immediate older brother of Jeb, and he is the guy who's famous in the story when Jeb attacks the hornet's nest, William retreats and runs and Jeb attacks and gets stung. And William is one of the people who told the story. I think he was 14, Jeb was nine when this happened. So he's bragging about his little brother. Well, William Alexander Stewart promised Jeb Stewart that no matter what happened in the war, that he would take care of Jeb's family. William Alexander Stewart ends up running the salt works in Sopel during the war. After the war, he becomes, I think, the founder of Stewart Land and Cattle Company. He becomes one of the biggest landowners east of the Mississippi River. His son is going to be governor of Virginia uh, in World War I. But Jeb's brother William is going to take care of his mother, who's going to come live with him. I think at least two of his sisters are going to come to Saltville and live with him. He's going to take care of Jeb's widow, Flora who's gonna come and live with him in Saltville. And uh, William Alexander Stewart, again, is one of these people who, uh, I can't imagine how Jeb Stewart's wife and children would have survived without him, because he had the means. And here's a story about him. You remember that $5,000 I talked about for the saber hitching device that he got? He had put that in a bank in St. Louis. 
and uh, I think he probably figured the U.S. government confiscated it or something. But no, William Alexander Stewart goes to St. Louis and gets that $5,000 and gives it to Flora Cook Stewart, Jib's widow, and that's how she's able to get started in life again. She's able to have enough money. She's going to end up going to Stanton, Virginia, where she's going to become the uh, headmistress of the Virginia Female Academy, the VFI, not to be confused with the VMI, and uh, it's now Stewart Hall. Uh, they named it after her. So it's an Episcopal girls' school, and she's going to spend the rest of her life uh, teaching there until her daughter dies. And she's going to move down to Norfolk and will take care of her grandchildren and help raise them. And uh, Flora lives on until 1923. Uh, she, there's a lot of comparison, I think, to her and Libby Custer, except Flora had an opposite view. Libby Custer wanted to publish everything she could think of about George, and Flora didn't really want you to publish anything about Jeb, I don't think. I think she wanted everything. When John Mosby and some of them, you know, would get arguing about Gettysburg and the newspapers and stuff. I think Flora Cook, <laughs> Stewart, wishes they'd all just shut up. <laughs> she had a totally different view of that, and she guarded his reputation. She really did guard Jeb Stewart's reputation for years. So in 1861, war comes. Jeb Stewart waits to see what Virginia is going to do. You know, today it's very easy to talk about all this woke stuff and everything, but he thought of himself as a Virginian first. And I don't think if you read any of his letters, you can say otherwise. He really considered Virginia his country. So he waited. He wanted to see what Virginia would do. When Virginia seceded, Jeb Stewart resigns. He waits till May the 10th of 1861. He's already coming back home because he thinks it's happening. And he gets to uh, Cairo, Illinois. And that's where he resigns from the U.S. Army, May the 10th, 1861. He comes to Richmond. And uh, he's going to end up, of course, commanding the cavalry under Joe Johnston up in the Shenandoah Valley. And uh, you can go down and to the pavilion down here and read about Jeb Stewart's life in, in, the, in the Army. I'm not going to talk much about that. But... The last time I think he probably was here was, was 1859. And uh, he's going to go on, of course, to command all of Robert E. Lee's cavalry. He's going to have as many as 10,000 men on horseback at one point in, I think, the summer of 1863, where he's going to fight in places like Brandy Station. He's going to, again, continue to cultivate relationships. He and Stonewall Jackson, who are the most odd couple you could ever imagine, these two, you know, the dour Presbyterian and the uh, outgoing uh, Methodist Episcopalian that Jeb Stewart became. Uh, but yet, Jackson loved having Jeb Stewart around. Why? Because Jeb Stewart was competent. Stonewall Jackson didn't suffer fools. If you weren't doing your job, you didn't hang around old Stonewall too long. I had Bud Robertson as a professor in college, and trust me, you didn't hang around Bud Robertson too long either if you suffered fools. <laughs> but uh, Jackson is one of these men who really appreciates Stewart. Robert E. Lee is going to come to recognize that Jeb Stewart is the right man in the right place. One question that I get a lot in all this stuff is when Jackson is killed after Chancellorsville, uh, Jeb Stewart takes command for a while and commands the Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. And people will ask me, well, do you think Robert E. Lee should have left him in command of the Second Corps uh, of the infantry? And my response usually to that is, well, <laughs> he couldn't have done any worse than he did, I guess, in that, that thing. But he knew he had a great cavalryman, and Robert E. Lee you know, knew what he had. So uh, Robert E. Lee was really good at psychology. If you, uh, he knew the men he was fighting, he knew the men who was fighting with him. And uh, you gotta remember, Jeff Stewart is in his late 20s commanding almost 10,000 men on horseback. Uh, I hate to imagine in my late 20s what I'd have been commanding, but imagine that. He had that many men under his command. So Stewart, of course, is going to go on, become a major general. He's going to fight with Robert E. Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia uh, for all the major battles. In May of uh, 1864, he's going to be shot uh, in the gut at Yellow Tavern 
They're going to take him into Richmond. 